So yesterday was the first announcement of a new book coming out called Awakening the Soul, A Deep Response to a Troubled World. And I began the book with the idea of describing the old idea of the soul's great adventure, or what I sometimes call the second adventure of life. And my thinking was that with the world in so much trouble, with the environmental challenges and threats, with the humanitarian crisis that's happening all over the world, with the crisis about justice, and the crisis about truth and meaning, that this is a time when the second adventure of life, the soul's adventure, is ever more important. So the core idea is that the first adventure of life is to get a life, to grow up, step into the world, try things, succeed, fail. It almost doesn't matter from the point of view of the soul. It's just to enter the marketplace of life and the struggle of existence and find out who we are, which we can find out partly by failing and sometimes by succeeding. At any rate, that's the first adventure, and everybody has to do it to some degree. Of course, the modern world now thinks that's the only adventure, and so they elect someone like Donald Trump, who's still trying to prove that he's real because of that first adventure, despite the fact that he mostly cheated to win in that adventure. But the second adventure is the adventure of the soul, the expression of the core of one's life, the the waking up to the dream that brought us to life the soul's wonderful attempt to become itself and learn how to express itself into the world for the benefit of ourselves, but also for the benefit of the world. That second adventure is the most important thing now. And the idea, original idea of the book was that whether it's a young person or an old person, that second adventure has become more important. And so in the book, there is a chapter on the second adventure of life, and that's fine. But in starting to write the book, two things happen. Ideas come to me that I didn't have before. Actually, I wake up in the middle of the night with paragraphs and words kind of descending, and I try to catch them, get up and write them down in the dark and so on. And the book begins to take shape between the ideas I already had and things that are coming from the other world by virtue of dream or by virtue of a sudden inspiration or by virtue of a story that pops into my mind that I hadn't been thinking about but now I have to try and learn from. So the writing of the book itself becomes, for me, a second adventure, a soul adventure. And I'm learning what I'm supposed to be writing while I'm in the process of writing. And I realized that before getting to the second adventure, I was going to have to explain to a greater degree what the soul is and why the soul is so important. And so the book really begins with trying to understand the loss of soul throughout the world. In other words, it's a loss of soul when people feel disconnected from nature and the environment and think that human nature is not part of great nature. That's a loss of soul, a loss of the connection of soul. And then you see the loss of soul continuing where oppression and injustice grow. And people reject other people because of their appearance, not realizing or forgetting or being afraid to step into the reality that's the soul of the other person that matters. And that living in this tumultuous world that can turn upside down at any moment, it also matters that the individual soul is connected to the soul of the world. And that living out the true adventure of one's own soul not only gives us meaning and a greater connection to the world at all levels, but it also contributes meaning back into the world, and therefore it feeds the soul of the world. So the beginning of the book then becomes this kind of introduction to the nature of the human soul and to the connection of the human soul to the soul of the world, and the idea that we change the world from the inside out, from the depths of the human soul, things try to awaken and enter the world in order to shift the meaning of things. Turns out that the human soul requires meaning. The expression of truth, especially from the inside out, is a nutrition for the soul. It helps grow the soul. And so when we wind up in a culture where people are denying 
even the existence of truth. Or people want to say we're in a post-truth world. They're actually saying we've lost our souls. We're not connected to our own souls anymore. We've lost the sense that each life is meaningful. We've lost the knowledge that each soul is unique and therefore important and intended to grow when a person lives their life into the world. That yes, on the first adventure, we have to connect to life the way we find it. But when we find the world around us to be upside down more often than not, to not be making sense, it is the deeper sense and meaning that the soul carries that's missing. Truth and meaning are deep issues of the soul. The pain we feel about life, whether it's the struggle of the first adventure or the second adventure, are both the struggle to become real to become a genuine expression of our own lives. And according to all the old stories, according to myth and imagination, the seeds of our life are already in us. So part of the crisis of meaning is the current idea in the modern world that people are just a speck in a vast, endless universe, an accidental universe at that. So in a way, we have to struggle to become meaningful again, to reestablish the idea, yes, each soul, each person is a tiny speck in a grand universe, but at the same time, each person has a speck of the original star that burst when the universe was beginning. We're all connected to the beginning through our souls. And because that's true, If we can change our souls, we can begin to change the world. Until a person realizes that we are essentially connected to the soul of the world, it is hard to imagine how we change all the injustices of human culture and how we change all the threatening aspects of nature and the environment. The change actually has to begin deep in the human soul, and that's why I wound up calling the book Awakening the Soul, that we're trying to awaken things of the natural inheritance of the human soul that we have forgotten or been told don't exist. We need to awaken them in order to understand the difference between being real, being genuine and purposeful, and what is happening in the culture where people are saying there is no truth, there's alternative facts, And we can't prove truth by arguing about the facts. We prove truth by living the truth of our own souls. And that's what the book winds up being about. It turns out that awakening the soul is different than simply waking up from a night's sleep. So there's an old idea that says there's two states that are common in the world. One is being asleep and not awake. And the other is being awake But being awake in that first level of life, waking up from sleep and going to work, waking up from sleep and just wandering about. And so that first kind of level of waking up is not awakening. Awakening is a deeper sense of being present and being aware. And strangely enough, when a person awakens, when the soul awakens, we're able to see both into the daily world, ways in which we can change things or be a greater part of things, but also we can see into the dream world, which is where the world keeps trying to be remade in a sense. So the greater awakening is waking up to the dream of life we each brought to the world and beginning to see into the dream that's trying to live through us. And so the ancient idea was that a person actually has two sets of eyes. The first set of eyes open usually right after birth, and the eyes of the infant looking around at an amazing world that it didn't even know existed, having been inside the mother's womb and inside the internal cosmos of the mother until it's born, and those eyes awaken, and hopefully we have 20-20 vision or something close to it, and we can perceive things as they are outside of us, But later in life, there's supposed to be the deeper awakening, which opens the second set of eyes, which used to be called the eyes of initiation. 
And so then the book turns out to be about opening the inner eyes of initiation in order to see more fully into the world, but at the same time, in order to see with insight into the depth and meaning and purpose and aim of our own souls, because until we can do that, we cannot become really fully agents of meaningful change in a world that needs to change on all levels. And the story is an old Native American story in which a tribe wants to find greener pastures or a greater abundance of life. And so they decide to take off and go looking for a better place to live. And they pack up all the teepees and everything and they take off and they leave behind an orphan boy. And they leave him behind, they say, because he's not okay. He's not proper. The fact is he's deaf and he appears to be dumb because he's deaf. And they say to him, we're leaving you behind because you might hurt our chances of finding a new way to be because you are deformed or, or defective. And so the orphan boy is left in this empty village, this vacated village. And of course, he's ashamed by the whole thing. And actually, he can't even hear what they're saying. He just interprets by their feelings and by their gestures that they're rejecting him. And he feels utterly rejected, sits in this empty village with his head down until one day he realizes he will stay there forever if he doesn't somehow wake up. And his experience of waking up is to realize that he has to go after that village. He has to go after that tribe. The very people that rejected him, he has to go and try to join them. They're the only people he knows. And despite the rejection or because of it, he has to catch up to them and find a way of being accepted and waking up to that reality that he will otherwise be depressed and rejected and alone and isolated for his entire life. In waking up to that, he gets the energy to begin to run and he's running after the village that has disappeared into the distance and as he runs with all of his might his ears pop and for the first time in his life he can hear a stream of water running on the side of the path he's on and he can hear the birds singing in the trees standing by the stream and from his other ear he can hear all the soft movements of the branches of the trees when the wind moves through the forest and it's as if he's born for the first time it's as if he's arrived in the world and as his ears pop and he begins to hear he also begins to see the beauty of the world for the first time as if his eyes have actually opened for the first time and running with all his might he catches up to where the village has now settled and as he comes running in there an old chief sees him and says "Ooh, that was a wrong thing that we did we shouldn't have left that orphan behind that was lacking in compassion was ungenerous on our part and besides he looks like he's very alert and maybe we misunderstood him and so that old chief invites him over and begins to feed him and then he notices that the boy is hearing things and so he begins to help him understand language and eventually he takes him in like a son and then he trains him to be a real person a genuine person and that boy who was the orphan left behind becomes the one who gets a great vision that helps the entire tribe see past the idea of just living in that first level of life. And he begins to show people the greater vision, which I'm in the book calling the second adventure of life. So the old chief, recognizing something visionary and genuine, meaningful in the boy, who was rejected by everyone and considered a useless orphan, realizes that the boy has never been given a proper name. And so he gives him a name and he calls him Long Arrow, as if intuiting that this once rejected orphan child is actually going to have the arc of imagination that's going to carry the tribe somewhere like a long arrow aimed into the future. And so it turns out that the thing we most need in order to find the true arc of our own lives, in order to connect more deeply to the natural nobility and visionary capacity of our own souls, 
is to somehow awaken to the orphan parts of our own selves. So in the book, I wind up writing about how at a young age, perhaps similar to the orphan boy, I'm imagining him at 10 or 11 or something like that, something eye-opening happened to me. And I couldn't see fully all that it was, but a kind of blinking of the inner eyes of initiation allowed me to see into life in such a way as to get a glimpse of what my life was supposed to be about. So I wind up writing about that. I'm trying to say that this kind of book comes from the other world almost, from waking at night and having my ears popping and not knowing if it's actually happening or it's happening in a dream. And the answer is yes, it's happening in both ways. But then that's supposed to help me remember something about when my own ears popped, when the my own eyes opened from inside the soul a little bit. And that leads to the idea that we're each trying to open the eyes of the deep soul in order to see the world anew, in order to see the whole thing differently, because as it is now, as people understand it, as people see it, it is falling apart on all levels. When meaning is lost, when truth is rejected, we all become orphans in this world at the level of the soul because our souls came here to live out an inner truth that has meaning not just for us but for other people and also ultimately meaning for the soul of the world. We're orphans in this world and yet it's from that state of feeling orphaned or rejected or isolated that we can awaken as in the story of the orphan boy and have our ears pop and our inner eyes open and begin to see in a more awakened way, not just the world that we have been delivered into, but the one that we have come here to help deliver the world that we actually want to be in together. 